Hey, everybody. How you doing? Hi, Good, Brent. Hi, Brent. Hey, Good. Doug. Chris. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Gabe, how are you? I'm good, Chris. Thank you. Chris, it looks like, um, oh, there's Daphne. Because um, for the rest of you, uh, Chris, I mean, no, Keegan won't be here. So everybody else, as soon as Daphne's on, everybody else is here. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get this meeting started. Time we got right on five o'clock. I'd like to call to order the Public Safety Commission regular meeting of August 3rd, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We navigate the process. Commissioners and city staff participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to sign up to speak on a particular item or items or the tab to watch the meeting. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you sign up to speak before an item is called and are present in the Zoom meeting. So please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. Commissioners, if you have comments to make during this meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. You would think we would have that memorized after two and a half years, but I don't. Uh, can you take the roll call, please, Mary? Of course. Commissioner Neat. You're muted, able... Daphne. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> Commissioner Spiegel. Present. Vice Chair Stewart. Present. Chair Frost. Present. Ex officio member Woodworth. Uh, present. Thank you. You have a quorum. Uh, we were advised that Commissioner Gibbs will not be here this evening. All right. I just lost everybody on there. Hold on here. Greg, would you like to uh, do the national, or excuse me, the national anthem, do the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> yeah, I don't think you want me singing the national anthem. Nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> All right. Well, if everybody will join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance by placing your right hand over your heart and ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Uh, can I have a, an emotion, uh, an emotion, an approval of the agenda? Someone want to step up on that? Okay, I'll make the motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Chair Frost? Yes. Commissioner Spiegel? Yes. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Anit? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Report on posting, Mary? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on July 29th, 2022. Thank you. We have no ceremonial presentations. Uh, do we have any written or oral communication from the public? We have no speakers tonight. No speakers, all right. No. Well, let's go to staff updates, shall we? Um, Luis? Yeah, good, good evening, commissioners. Uh, quick staff updates here. Uh, on the homelessness front, things are steady as always. Uh, the outreach work is being done. Uh, we're, we're currently out of uh, Deputy Espinoza, who's who's out. We usually count on on the homelessness front, but he'll be back soon. But in the meantime, the outreach team has been filling in and checking in the spots that he uh, normally covers. So we're good on that front. Uh, we're still waiting officially on the um, official homeless count numbers, which are tentative for September. So hopefully we're able to get those sometime next month so that we can report uh, for the next Public Safety Commission meeting. So 
homelessness front, we're doing well. Uh, we have a Homelessness Connect Day on September 22nd uh, that is being done in partnership with uh, the county, uh, Supervisor uh, Sheila Kiel's office, as well as our outreach team um, and a wealth of other service providers who will be um, coordinating this you know, big, big event here at the Malibu Library with a wealth of different resources uh, for folks. Uh, you know, obviously with the goal of getting, you know, everybody integrated into the continuum of care and eventually into a form of shelter and housing. So it's going to be a good event. Uh, more on that as we get closer. Uh, as far as the impound yard, uh, we had 10 vehicles to towed this past weekend. So we're at a total of 167 uh, total since we began. Uh, so good number. Uh, still no reported issues. Everything's been going smooth. There hasn't been a large amount of vehicles that have been left up until closing that have been taken over the hill. That's still a very small number. Um, but yeah, 167 total on that. Um, and the sheriffs will be working very, very hard on, on uh, activating that during the weekend. Um, as well in the automated license plate readers, those cameras have been ordered. Uh, so we're just waiting for those to get shipped and for us to receive those. Uh, we're told sometime in August if there are no uh, major shipping delays, but hope to have those soon. And then of course work with, uh, you know, Rob and his team, as well as whoever else we need to work with to get those up and up and running as soon as possible. But uh, those cameras are incoming. And I know uh, in one of the previous meetings, we talked about the Knox boxes. Uh, so that's a tentative uh, council item for September 12th. Uh, so that should be coming up in the upcoming city council meeting uh, where we'll be talking more about the Knox box. I know uh, the commission talked about uh, exploring the community education route, which is you know what we'll be uh, presenting to the city council on the 12th. Uh, we have also have a couple of other items, public safety related, that will be presented that day, which of course Greg and uh, Gabriel will be leading as far as emergency uh, declarations go um, and so forth. But they can they can touch a bit on that. So I'll pass it on to uh, Gabriel and Greg on the fire safety side. Okay, I, I'll just uh, save mine for my presentation because oh. that'll be included. So uh, I don't know if Greg or Brad have anything to add. Um, all I have, let me see if I'm, yeah, all I have to add is that um, we are working on the local policy of the, for the existence of a local emergency due to uh, fire weather. And so we'll be touching on that at a later date as well. Um, we did send to the assistant city manager um, the outline of a proposal. So that's in the works right now. That's all I have. Um, hey, Greg, um, this is the first time that you've been on our Zoom, correct? Yes. Could you, would you mind, I don't want to pose on you too much, just give a, a quick synopsis of your fire career, what you bring to the table there, because it's, it's actually pretty cool. So maybe let some of the people on here that don't know you know okay, what you've been sure. doing. Sure. Yeah. Well, to introduce myself, I'm Greg Heisel. So uh, I retired from Los Angeles County Fire Department after 35 years of service. Um, worked in a variety of positions, firefighter, firefighter, paramedic, engineer, captain, um, battalion chief, and I retired as an assistant chief. Um, I worked out in Malibu in a number of different capacities. I was a firefighter at station um, 67. I was an engineer at old 71s, not the new 71s. <laughs> I did time. They call it doing time at the old 71s. So yeah, <laughs> I did my time there. And then um, I was battalion five, which is all of the Santa, Santa Monica mountains. Um, and so uh, but that includes station 70, 88, 71, 99, all those stations. So um, I was twice assigned as battalion five and then uh, finished out my career out in Santa Clarita. So um, great career, loved it. Um, married for 35 years and have um, two adult kids that are living at home. So just to be brief. Thanks, Greg. Brad, did you have... Uh... Uh, I didn't have any of uh, the, the safety issue except for um, our home uh, ignition zone assessments. Our start actually three to do tomorrow. Uh, so it seems like the public is starting to get the word out and the interest is out there. So um, we just got to keep them coming and start letting these folks learn how, uh, what to do to, to prep when the fire, if and when that fire ever does come. So yeah, it's starting to pick up and get a little busier with those assessments. Great. 
Um, I bet you're enjoying talking to people about their landscaping. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Your specialty. So, yeah. um, Luis, did you, you mentioned the date on Homeless Connect, September 22nd, right? That's correct, yeah. I didn't hear what you said. You have some flyers, don't you? That's correct. I'm uh, are we happy to circulate those to everybody. I'll work with Mary to get those out. Good. That'd be great. Um, yeah, Gabriel yeah. Graham gave me one. They're good flyer. Good to get uh, them out there. So absolutely. And we can we can pass it off to Sarah for a quick update on CERT too as well. Where, you, I don't see her. Oh, there she is. Hey, here, Chris. Hi, That's Sarah. Go ahead. I see how it is. Good evening, yeah. everyone. Um, just a few updates. So our first in-person CERT class graduated last Saturday. We had four graduates, another four to five pending, depending on when they're able to complete their missing classes. We have a few awesome events coming up. One is going to be the NOAA fire weather distribution. Um, Megan Courier is going to be coming to City Hall on August 18th. That is a Thursday from nine to noon and distributing the no weather radios. Ideally, uh, those folks who are picking up the radios will have pre-registered and they'll just be coming in to pick them up. If not, uh, they can fill out the paperwork online right there and get their free NOAA fire weather radio. Additionally, I want to remind everyone that next month is September National Preparedness Month and we do have several cool events coming down the pike. We're just finalizing the details for that month and uh, look for an update to that uh, in the coming weeks. That's it for me. Thank you. Appreciate that, Sarah. Um, anything else from public safety? If not, I will move on to Rob DeBow, Public Works. So good afternoon, commissioners. A few things that I want to bring up to, to everyone. Um, first thing is, uh, what Doug has mentioned uh, last meeting, and, and he reminded me to follow up to make sure on the um, the generators for the water district. So I reached out to the water district, got some information on what they're doing out there. Uh, they still have the temporary generators stationed, ready to go in Big Rock. Those are out there. Um, they intend to keep them out there. I think they may have moved them temporarily to do maintenance or look at it and kind of do some things. It's, it's a lot easier to do the maintenance probably at, out there at their shop in their yard to kind of do that. But they, they have every intention to kind of keep them there. Um, if they do move them, uh, um, they will make sure the corresponding uh, water tanks are full to their max. So they could um, remove those. There won't be any issue with water pressure or anything else if something happens and then quickly re uh, replace those back. Um, there's also, I've also checked into what, what the district has planned on, on other outages for other tanks that are in, in the, in the, uh, within the city. Um, they do have a series of portable generators, uh, truck mounted, um, ready to go. They have a bunch of them at their yard and um, they have those ready to deploy out to the different sites when needed. Uh, I, and I remember this specifically during during Wesley. I, I coordinated with a water district on getting some of those those generators out to the sites, especially the one on Bush Drive um, to, uh, during the fire. So um, they have a pretty good plan for the upcoming fire season and have those generators set and ready to go. A um, couple things that I want to bring up too is another thing I want to bring up as you kind of know. Uh, last month, Caltrans did a meeting, public meeting, and they discussed uh, um, adding bike lanes and removing parking on PCH, which I tried to convince them um, that's not a good idea of uh, removing all parking on PCH. You can't do that without getting a coastal development permit and uh, working with the Coastal Commission. But they proceeded to do their meeting and say that anyway. Quite disappointing. But um, they have reached out to me and they are uh, interested on, in my um, input on what can be done out on PCH from um, basically from Malibu Canyon Road all the way through to the um, westerly city limits on, on bike, bike lanes improvements in, in that area. So uh, Caltrans and I have been meeting on a regular basis once a week 
kind of trying to strategize and look at the different options that they can that they can do out there. Um, the good thing out there, uh, two things that I want to mention on, on the stretch is that there is a good good series of existing no parking already out there, and, and I think Caltrans can really enhance that area and make it safe, safer for cyclists. Um, I think there's some other opportunities where they can reduce the median width a little bit to account for more shoulder width in, in those areas and um, put together a standard uh, shoulder width so they can have that available for um, both vehicle parking and also for uh, bicycle safety. Um, also, also, I've been coordinating a lot with uh, the Trenkas Bridge. I, I, I know there has been a lot of um, issues with that. Uh, there has been some issues about uh, um, the, the pile driving and the noise and everything that's going on with that. But they they have um, they're required to actually do some soundproofing on that. But they've also did some paving, temporary paving out there in, in the travel lanes to kind of reduce that rumble strip that's out there. Um, and that's about all I have for public safety. Um, I'm available for questions if the commissioners have any. I have one. Um, and when we're talking about the generators, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sure maybe Doug probably would bring this up if I didn't. So originally we kind of like, I think intimated that what we wanted was permanent generators there. So all somebody had to do is flip a switch or it switch over automatically, um, you know, and switch over when the power went out. Now, what we've got is we've got a human being that's gonna have to show up possibly during a critical time to get a generator in. And I, I'm a little concerned about, do we trust District 29 to show up with that generator? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I have experience and, and I've witnessed them showing up uh, at, at those sites and doing that and, and being able to do there. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure if they did an automatic transfer switch over there in Big Rock, but I'd be surprised if they did. Uh, um, I could look into that and kind of find out if they had yeah. it in there. That's a that's another kind of um, feature that they have. Um, they would have to probably add to the temporary generator, but I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but there is that capability of doing that. Another thing that I failed to mention too is what the, I was talking to this was I'm, I'm talking to um, uh, um, to to the rep out there which is uh, um, Bill Johnson and um, he mentioned that those uh, pump stations and everything already have kind of uh, quick connect connections to the generators and so they can easily quick come up there plug it in and then it's be set ready to go so um, yeah, I've witnessed some of that, all that stuff happening in Wesley Fire, especially the one over there on Bush Drive and how um, they were able to, get, able to get in there, kind of monitor the, uh, monitor the um, water tank flow and then be able to kind of quickly get a, get a generator out there, so. All right, fair enough. If you're comfortable with the way they're doing it, I'm sure you'll make decisions and talk to them about, you know, assuring us that we get it done properly. You know, honestly, getting those things switched on when the power goes off, that's the whole point of it to begin with. So, yeah. All right. I, I mean, um, luckily, I, I mean, luckily, they have pretty good monitoring of those tank, uh, tank levels and be able to kind of deploy those generators and have enough time to do that, switch them over and do that if they don't have automatic transfer switches. Yeah. Chris, I, I had a question. Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. Uh, Rob, I, I'm. My background, I'm huge familiar with critical data centers around the world. And one of the things that we would do in this situation, I've been up to where those generators are, like in Big Rock, is the question I would have for them is, if they're going to take a generator out to do maintenance on it back to their yard, couldn't they, while the generator's there, temporarily put a trailer generator back up uh, with an automatic transfer switch and automatic start capability? The reason to do that is that if a fire was to start, as you know, in Big Rock, there's only one way in and one way out. So let's assume they can't get in. Um, so without a generator, as soon as that water tank is depleted, you know, you're, you're stuck. Um, so just to, as a measure of additional safety, if that just something to think about is 
just go ahead and do the swap, have it sitting there. So in a worst case scenario, you already have a generator on site with automatic transfer and startup capabilities, just in case um, that doesn't hurt. Second part of the question I've got actually has to do with Caltrans. Caltrans had their meeting, like you said. Um, would they comment to you about the Coastal Commission and you know, gee, what's the impact of them doing this without talking to Coastal? I, I, I warned them. I told them not to not to do that, and they did it anyway. I, I'm just, and so I, um, I I've had communications with uh, their deputy directors, and, and, and they were pretty upset that their team went forward on and did that anyway after I told them not to. So it's, yeah, they have some eggs egg on their face, and they're trying to do what they can to. Um, um, make it better. So uh, um, yeah, and I'm trying to make it better for them too. Um, it's it, it's work. We work in conjunction with them. I, I'm uh, working really good to make sure that we have a good working relationship with them and, and um, making sure they kind of follow kind of my advice on some things. But sometimes you can't, you can lead a horse to water, so you can't make them drink. And this was that case. Thank you. Doug? Uh, Quick comment, you know, that uh, backup generators, they're sitting at the yard, what, at uh, um, Central, not Central City, but uh, I think like Culver City or something like that. Um, that's a long way away when the, in an emergency. I, oh, I would say no, they have no, it's no, it's in the yard here and within the city. Oh, within the city. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. That makes me feel a lot better. Yeah. Um, yeah. One other thing on uh, uh, electricity issues, did you ever find out what happened with the batteries on the, the uh, Traffic signals when we had the power outage a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I haven't got anything back yet from Caltrans on that. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, my experience on sometimes when we have those big power spikes, it just zaps the whole thing. And I think there is a uh, some type of fuse or something that they need to kind of have in there to make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, they, they get a big power spike and sometimes that causes some havoc with the powers, with the um, automatic transfer switch and battery backup systems at, at those at those traffic signals. And so I, I'm still trying to get some little bit of information from from Caltrans on that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions there? We um, we don't know that. Let's. Uh... Chair Frost. Yes. Um, I was notified that. Uh, Ryan was having some trouble signing up to speak, and he did want to speak under public comment. Do you want to open sure. open that? Okay, that's fine. Uh, thank you. I wanted to tell you I've been working for twenty minutes trying to log on, and your system wasn't working. So, um, the what I wanted to mention is that um, when we were discussing last month. Um, the issues of coordinating with HOAs and that the city would be sending letters out, for instance, to um, promote um, the city's um, Knox box uh, option for the uh, sheriff to have entry to vehicle gates and, and uh, you know, gated complexes that it's important to renew the letter of agency that the sheriff has uh, for authorization to arrest trespassers. This is a big deal, especially it, it applies to even vacant property where there have been some problems recurring and maybe even on the east end at Tuna Canyon. But the letters of agency, I believe, expire um, that the authorization is limited for a year, which seems to be an awfully short time, especially some HOAs only meet annually uh, and getting people to sign that, for instance. So that part of what I suggested was omitted from the minutes. I wanted to make sure that um, it is included, so I'll bring it up as my single item this time. Thank you. Is that it? Brian, are you done? Uh, my mic was cut off. I'm sorry. I, it, whenever I use the word minutes, that mic seems to just turn off. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. 
Um, there was the death of Trancus, which, uh, you know, I couldn't hear if you discussed that. Um, I wanted to say that I had a discussion today with um, the homicide uh, detective for the Trancus uh, death March 29th of this year that's now been four months. And that's uh, Homicide Lieutenant Vince Ursini. And he, uh, I prompted him to call and, and give an update to uh, Chad Waters. I hope that's occurred already. Um, but uh, they were still waiting for info, I think, from the coroner. And it's been four months. I think that's a little too long. I would like to uh, request um, or make note of that. Uh, maybe Mary can get with uh, whoever is in charge of City Hall at the moment. And I think that's a little bit too long. We don't have a lot of deaths out here and it shouldn't take that long to get an answer from an autopsy. Um, so, uh, but the gist of the conversation uh, was that it does not look like it was a homicide at all. It's just started the investigation in that department and it will remain in that department until it's concluded. Uh, but they're just still pending the, the coroner's report, which seems a bit ridiculous at this point for toxicology and so forth. Thank you. Now I'm done. Thank you, Brian. Um, let's go to commissioner's comments. Daphne, start with you if you want, or I can. I don't have any specific comments for tonight. Thanks, Chris. Okay, uh, Brent. Sure, th thanks, Chris. Thank you, everybody. A um, couple of things, Lewis, thanks for the update on the, the impound yard. Um, I know that was, you know, it's always something to keep an eye on. How is that working? How is the public reacting to it and so forth? I was glad to hear that it, it appears it's been effective, which is which is excellent. It's one of those things that's, that's definitely needed. So um, I appreciate that and look forward to continuing to hear how it's going, any issues or anything that comes up on that. Um, as you guys know, one of the major focus that I have is always on um, the fire side of it, and I know we're going to hear from Megan and Drew, so I won't I won't say uh, too much about that. Other than uh, I'm very pleased uh, the organization that we have in our community brigade concept, and also working with um, Cal Fire, and we've been in contact with the regional chief David uh, Fulcher, who has been very receptive to having conversations with us as well. And I look forward to uh, interfacing with uh, uh, Greg and Gabe, uh, Brad and so forth on the home ignition zone issues. I do have um, one question I do have from the Malibu side on the emergency management piece. I know that the contractor was picked and so forth to do a emergency tabletop exercise for Malibu. I would sure love to participate in that, that exercise. Um, and be glad to help out any way I can if a date is picked for when that when that occurs. So um, that's pretty much what I've got, and I'll you know comment later uh, when the fire department talks about their stuff. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Brent. Uh, Josh. Thank you, Chris. Um, I have a couple things. Um, I don't know if uh, Lieutenant Carr is is on here. I'd like to welcome Lieutenant Carr to. Uh, uh, replaced uh, Chad Waters, but um, my my question for uh, Lieutenant Carr or anyone from Lost Hills, you know, I was actually the person who found the uh, deceased person up at Trancus, so I don't, I don't know if I'm actually allowed to talk about anything. If I am, I'm more than happy to explain what I feel happened um, to the public. Um, Josh, can we save that for the um, item 5B? Sure. I think that makes more sense. So hang in there, Ryan, I'll, I'll get to you, man, if, if I'm allowed. Um, and then the other thing, um, we had something really cool happen in uh, Malibu West. Um, and I think that um, it's worth talking about a little bit. Um, it was also cover, it was also on the cover of the Malibu Times. You know, what, we had about 200 goats come and do some brush clearance. And, you know, when they got here, I was like, uh, I don't know if this is gonna work. I wasn't really too high on them, but- Hey, Terry. Um, <laughs> uh, so not only did the goats do a great job, but it really brought the community together. And I think that, um, it's just, it's a very unique and strange confluence between public safety 
and kind of rural character. And uh, I don't think that we get that very much. So if there's any way that we can explore Cal Fire grants or other other grants for uh, goat brush clearance in our community, I think that that we should look into it. Um, it's relatively inexpensive and it's just really cool for the neighborhoods. So um, that's all I got. And um, as far as the Trankus thing, I'll uh, discuss that 5B. Thanks. Doug Stewart. Okay. Um, first off, I want to welcome what we now have as a complete uh, fire dream team. Uh, <laughs> really talented people here and uh, welcome aboard, uh, Greg, and uh, look forward to meeting you in person. Uh, these Zoom meetings, I, I hate. I wish we were shaking hands more often. Uh, some questions that I uh, want to check on. Beacon boxes, how are we doing on those? Uh, somebody got an update on the uh, status of those? Yes, Doug, I do. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so the, the beacon boxes, I'm I'm happy to report. Um, he had to complete the map validation of the original maps that we were given by the vendor, and we were quoted a pretty exorbitant cost for them to do this. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to say we did it on our own and, and saved the city a large sum of money. Uh, we completed that about seven weeks ago. Uh, we've been in contact with, with uh, Flame, Flame Mapper. Um, we are waiting our second set of 10 boxes. Uh, he has to generate the maps for us. I have the original um, eight boxes currently still at City Hall. I have all the hardware for them, all the places picked out. Um, we had some hurdles to overcome. We had to get City Council uh, to create a waiver for us to go on to properties and install them. So. Uh, of the eight properties that we want to do right now, six are ready to go. Uh, Public Works has been phenomenal with Rob and his team and the support of that. Um, I had two problem properties that are kind of slowing us down. One, the uh, homeowner's uh, president who could make the call on a property was out of the country for an extended period of time. Uh, he just got back in last week and I'm meeting with him Friday. So that'll give me seven of the eight properties we currently have that we can get going as early as uh, next week or whenever Public Works has is, is got some time. The last property has been a bit problematic. I've uh, talked extensively with them, showing them pictures, talked on the phone, emails, texts. They were excited about it. And it's been basically radio silence uh, from the for last month from them. I've repeatedly reached out. I've reached over the agency that oversees the Homeowners Association just this past week and ask them if they could please recontact uh, the board so that we can move forward. So if I hear nothing from them by Friday, I'm just gonna go ahead and move on the seven properties I have and put that eighth property aside um, kind of as, as projects for later. So uh, we'll be ready to go this Friday with seven of the eight that we currently have in City Hall. Okay, well Gabe, it sounds like we've got almost 20 boxes. Do you have an idea when those are gonna be uh, fully deployed? Are we gonna have them uh, say, Labor Day or fire season? Yeah, I, I would say that it's safe to say that we would have 20 boxes up uh, within a month from now. We only have 10 currently. We, we are waiting on the second 10 from Flame Mapper. So like I said, um, all the properties but one will be ready to go after this Friday. So I would certainly hope Flame Mapper can get those next 10 to us. He says they're ready um, and we can get those up in a within the probably a month's time or so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Luis, I'm gonna hit you with one I didn't uh, prep you for. Any idea on the bailment on the BOP car? Where are we at on that? Uh, soon no update. Uh, I know just prior, uh, Susan did reach out again. Our, our team I have an update. We received, oh. we received it. I uh, believe, Rob, are you working on getting that car? In, is Rob there? Yeah. yeah, I had to hunt and find my. Uh, thanks. I had to hunt and find. It's uh, yeah. From my understanding, that it's already at the uh, um, sheriff. That they already had. We've already had it. We've had it for a while. It's just now. It's just it needs to be run through that process. I, I think the next step would be to fit it with all of the um, electronic equipment that the sheriffs need to do, could do, and that's kind of the next step. It's, uh, I can answer a little bit of that. They, uh, 
the, everything came back, like Mary said, came back from the sheriff's department. It still has to go before the board of supervisors also. So before it can be sent out to have that work done, the board, board of supervisors has to agendize and hear it. Then it goes out. That's straight from Armstrong to Russo to me. Yeah, that's that's the last I heard on that, uh, Doug. Uh, what Chris just mentioned. Uh, not sure, Susan, if, if she's had more conversations. I know we've been reaching out, try to get that prioritized and, and on a you know agendized so we can get that vehicle up and running. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, st still in the works. Uh, hope, hope, hoping to have an update on that as soon as possible. That ca that car is going to be uh, so old. It's going to need a smog check before we get the uh, badges on it. Um, Let's see, one other thing I've got, uh, and this, you may not have an answer for this. Uh, one time we talked about putting signs up along PCH that said you're entering uh, uh, evacuation zone 12, you're exiting evacuation zone 13, because one of the things that I think we're going to find out is nobody knows what zone they're in. Um, just wondering if we had any update on that, or I should bring that up with Susan or someone at a later date. So I can actually take that one. Um... We are in the pen, we're working with LA County OEM and Los LA County Fire to get onto the zone haven system. There was some debate in the past about potentially changing the zones. Mm -hmm. So that uh, zone sign has been shelved until that zone map is finalized. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just would like to get that done sooner rather than later. Um, oh, Rob I, has something. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 so Doug, you you prompted me there. There's something else that I wanted to kind of let everybody know. Um, uh, we did get a request from. I, I was been working with Chad and the deputies out there on um, the issues about having the RVs parking on the, those shoulder areas, especially over by Trancas, and um, they were trying to cite all of those RVs that are out there for based on an oversized ordinance, they requested uh, um, us to kind of help help them kind of give those RVs a, a little bit more notice out there. So we have our original overhead um, ordinance sign that we put at all the entrances according to our CDP and um, talk to our planning department to see if we can add more signs out there. Um, they recommended that we don't put permanent signs out there. So I, I went out there and placed um, a bunch of the temporary um, A-frame kind of barricades out there with our sign out there. And so um, those people that are going out there and parking out there do have noticed that, hey, this is, you can't, you can't park here. Uh, um, this is, an, you know, this is a violation of our red. So they do have notice and the sheriff can go ahead and buy and uh, cite them. So. Sorry, I, I didn't bring that up. It, it's thank you, Doug, for reminding me. That, but, yeah. that, that's a swing and a miss, uh, Rob. I, I know, I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, they, thank, thank you, Rob. And a lot of that, um, you know, those discussions that Rob was mentioning came from the, those overnight operations. I think, Doug, we were there when the night when we went out. Uh, yeah. And so, we, you know, we were getting eyes on the RV situation, um, you know, and we've, we've uh, the sheriff's been working very proactively to try to address this as, you know, as efficient and effective as possible. So, you know, Rob, Rob did us a good one on that one. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, um, it, it's, we, I, I mean, I just want to just say kudos to everybody. I, I mean, the public works staff, um, those, everybody, um, and, and the sheriff's department, and we've been kind of re working really kind of really good lately. And, and it's kind of when things come up, we're collaborating really well and everything. And so I, I, I mean, I just want to say thank you, everyone. It's, it's, uh, um, it's making it it's making an impression out there so well, let's uh take a line from the old 18 uh tv show i love a plan when it comes together um two quick thing two more quick things for me uh on the license plate cameras uh my hoa is installing the flock cameras which are different than the ones that um city's putting in but we're running into the problem that we anticipated and that is the cell signals just are absolutely uh all over the place we're going to end up with uh, uh, two different uh, cell carriers within 500 feet of each other. So um, just ex just expect that when you put the cameras in, unless you're on PCH itself, it's going to be a challenge to get a good cell signal. You're going to have to be flexible. Uh, last thing I want to mention is um, an event that happened over the weekend. Uh, the Malibu 
uh, Democratic Club hosted a uh, forum for the two county supervisors. Had sort of a, um, I'll call it an ugly situation that didn't get out of hand with uh, protesters, probably about uh, 20 or so. Um, they were loud, um, and it was uh, took the sheriff's department and local security to uh, manage it. But it was handled well by everybody, and uh, kudos to the sheriff's department for uh, the way they handled it and the local security. They never got into the room, uh, but I got to tell you, it was uh, it was annoying. You couldn't hear yourself think part of the time. All right, that's all I've got. Uh, back to you, Chairman Frost. Thank you, Doug. I just have a couple of items here. Um, Rob, I picked up on those A-frames that you put out there in the turnouts. And I think I sent you a picture of one and said, great job. But um, those guys that come in there are generally not staying there. They're generally just passing through for three or four days. And they're still not supposed to park there. But um, the ones that are right along Zuma have been warned and they've been ticketed. And we now have a guy that it has got two RVs there. One of them is a big box truck that he has his weight set up in the back. So he goes and works out in the box truck and then goes back to his bus to live in that. So he's gotten his first ticket, the first hundred dollar ticket. The next one's 200. The next one's three or 500. And that goes for all three of the vehicles because they're all oversized. So as long as we have consistent enforcement on that out there, that will come to an end. Um, let me see. You know, I, I've kept up to date on what's going on with with the tow yard. And while this weekend was a little bit slow with nine, the weekend before had 32. Um, and and I think it, it all has to do with weather. You know, if it's hot in the valley and hot here, then we've got cars everywhere. And it, it, what it boils down to at that point is how many 180s get written, whether or not the uh, community service officers uh, from Lost Hills are going to write 180s to get those cars towed. And who's writing them? Some write a lot, some don't write any. It's kind of the luck of the draw. Our VOPs can't write 180s. They can, of course, ticket and they can call for a deputy to write a 180, but it kind of relies on everybody working together. So um, some weekends you're going to have only a few and maybe you don't have any CSOs out there. You only have a couple of them out there. And other weekends you're going to have a jackpot. Um, I think one weekend we had 40 something um, last summer. So that's literally, that's literally all I have. Um, yeah, that's it. So uh, can I um, ask for approval of the consent calendar? Somebody make a motion to approve that. Don't we have a, uh, perhaps an adjustment that Brian brought up? Do we have what? An adjustment, don't we have, didn't uh, Ryan say there was a correction? Do we need to address that? I didn't, did he say that? I lost Ryan some of what he was saying. On the record to be corrected because he had previously made reference to the fact that the, um, the letters that allow access to property, um, they expire after a year and he wanted there to be some consideration as to whether or not those uh, authorizations could be extended for more than a year. Because for the Homeowners Association to allow entry for the Knox box, right. if they only meet once a year, uh, it could be challenging. So I think that was his um, discussion at the last meeting and it did not make it into the minutes. Mary, can you comment on that? I do summary minutes. We don't do verbatim. We don't have to include everything, but if the commission wants me to edit the minutes, I will edit them and bring them back next month. I think that Mr. Embray, he made a point to with the suggestion and it's a good one. Okay. So we could just make an amendment to the minutes so that they're there. And Okay. Then if we can get a motion to continue. I'll make the motion to continue. I'll second it. Okay. Chair Frost? Yes. Commissioner Anit? Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm lost my place. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Spiegel? Yes. Motion carries. Thanks, Mary. 
Fair enough. So can we go back to approval of the consent calendar? No, I'll, that's uh, it. You just continued it to next month. Okay, just we just continued it. Okay, so we don't have to vote on that. We're just continuing you, it. You just did. Okay, fair enough. Okay. We did, you're right. Uh, so let's go to 5A and that would be Gabe. Good evening, everybody, again. Um, I thought with the uh, fire season and full tilt around the state, that it'd be a good time to look at the metrics that we use to assess our threat to us in the Santa Monica's and in Malibu in particular, um, and then to look at another set of metrics that we don't currently use, but might paint a, a little bit of a more complete picture of the fire threat to us. So we, we know that the metric that we use and we've used since I've been here uh, to assess that is the live fuel moisture. And live fuel moisture is an important component to the fire threat, but it doesn't really complete uh, the show the complete picture. So I wanna give an example of, of what I mean. You could take that slide, or you leave it up, so Parker, that's good. Um, the, the live fuel moisture gives us an idea of the fuel bed's receptiveness to fire. How well is it going to propagate fire? Um, we always report this to you on the commission, but now you can look at the chart that we get this off of. This comes from the Fire Department Division of Forestry. It comes out every two weeks throughout the year. And what it does is it measures the dry fuel, the fuel that's dried as compared to when it was fresh cut with moisture, and it gives us a percentage of the moisture content. So as we look at this chart, um, it gives us some really key information. And I don't know if any of you have ever looked at it, but I wanted to share it with you tonight. We have four different um, data lines. At the bottom, at the 60 percentile level, we have a black line with boxes. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with that being the critical level of live fuel moisture, that when it gets to that point, the fuel beds are in critical shape and they will propagate and spread fire rapidly. So that's kind of our, our bad point there. We look at the uh, solid black line that goes through the graph, and that is the historical average of all the data from 1981 to currently of the average at given times of the year. So it's kind of a good uh, way that we can track trends. Something I want to tell you guys is that this is not a zero to 100 scale. It's, it's actually quite a bit wider. So we look at that solid black line and we see the high point on average is about 140%. And we want that number to stay as high as we can throughout the year because when we have more moisture, the better. So it ranges from 140% and we can see that it dips down in late August uh, to an average of about 64%. So that's the historical average to give us perspective. The next thing that we look at on this graph is the red and the blue data lines. The blue data line gives us the exact life fuel moisture as we went through the year last year. And we can compare that to the red line, which represents the current year. So we look at some trends here. We look at, are we ahead of the curve or are we behind the curve? So you can see that both this year and last year, looking at that blue and red line, that we're well below what the average is at this time. That means we're ahead, the fuel beds are in worse shape. So this is a bad thing. Uh, on a good year, we're gonna stay at the average or above the average and hang on to that moisture as long as we can. So that's kind of the look at the four data lines. I'd like you to look at either the solid black line or the blue line. And that's kind of the representative low of the historical average and last year. And we see that the live fuel moisture doesn't change much, okay? Doesn't change much once it gets to this level. It doesn't fluctuate, it's very predictable. And so, so it's a kind of a good barometer of the fire threat, but it doesn't represent the whole picture, okay? And what I mean by this is, is as follows. Um, Currently, we're down into the near 70% on the live fuel moisture. This is getting near critical levels, but with the seasonable temperatures and conditions we have right now on the coast of 
you know, 75 degree days, seasonable winds, five to 20 miles per hour, humidities as high as the mid fifties. Um, even though that, that live fuel moisture is critical or near critical, if a fire were to start, it's not in alignment with the other components. So it's not a standalone barometer. And that's the point I'm trying to make. It's when we get the low humidity, the high winds and the high temperatures that everything becomes in alignment. And when a fire starts, it's, it's going to get ahead of steam on us. So right now, fires should not get to a, a, a very large uh, layer by any, um, any stretch of the imagination. So we're looking, um, I guess that's it for the graph. We could go to the next slide there, Parker. Um, looking back on my career, I was a captain in a very active wildfire area in Santa Clarita my last 12 years. And as I drove to work during the fire season and I, I wanted to get a uh, idea of what is the threat to fires if they start, um, I never once would look at the live fuel moisture. It's a very important component, but I knew based on the date that I could probably be within a few percentage points of what the live fuel moisture was at. It's very stable. So what I did look at and, and did follow for the fire threat, and I want to talk to you about tonight, is something we call the burning index or the burn index. Someone, some of us call us the BI. Um, I'm going to show you two places that we can find it, and it's very simple. Uh, this picture shows us an app that we can use to get the information. It's called Fire Sync Ops. I'm going to share a website with you later that's put out by the National Weather Service. It's called Fire One. They both get us to the same place, but they both have some different data along the way. So, Parker, if you could show the next slide, please. Um, so we want to go to the highlighted box there for weather, fire behavior. We're going to click on that. Next slide. And we want to go to Los Angeles County Fire Weather. Click on that. Go ahead, Parker. Next slide. And then we have a range of dates starting with the most current date. So we can also go back in time about 10 days and look at past uh, burn indexes and other fire weather components. Um, but we're going to look at the most current one. Go ahead, Parker, with the next slide, please. And this is the fire daily analysis sheet. Parker, if you'd go to the zoomed in version of this. So this is where we want to be. Um, you know, we all know that Los Angeles County is a very large geographical area. It's very diverse in its climactic zones. So when we look at the fire threat on a given day, we can't just look at one area or give a blanket for the whole area of the county. Uh, the county for purposes of the burning index and for live fuel moisture is broken into six different climactic zones. And that's how diverse we are. So as we look at this chart in front of us, we see what they are. Ours of course is the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, as we move away from us, we look at the Los Angeles Basin, uh, the Santa Clarita Valley, the Antelope Valley, the High Country, and Catalina. And those are the geographical areas that we break the burn index and the live fuel moisture down into. So I wanted to take a few minutes tonight, explain this daily fire danger analysis, and talk about what the bad levels are and what the normal levels are and how to interpret it. Uh, there'll be a lot of numbers, percentages, but in the end, I'm going to give you just two really simple components to consider uh, when you look at this, and you can get an idea of the fire threat. So we look at the Santa Monica Mountains, and what happens is we gather data from the National Weather Service, and it goes to our forestry division. And the forestry division takes those key numbers, puts it in the software, and it also adds in components like what is the fuel load for the area and what is the fuel type. And then it does its mathematical uh, algorithm, goes through and it comes up with the burn index. If you look at the right side of the screen, that's where we see the burn indexes, okay? But the Santa Monica Mountains, just like all the other areas, take samples from around that geographical area. So for example, you can see the six areas on the screen here. We have Chesboro, Malibu Hills, Beverly Hills, Leo Carrillo, Malibu Canyon, and Topanga. All of these areas are inputted into the system 
to create an average for the area. Um, our area of concern is what we say, our side of the hill of the Santa Monica Mountains, but the Santa Monica Mountains incorporate the areas on the other side of the hill along a 101 corridor. So that's why you see Chesboro up there, Beverly Hills. So we're looking at an overall average, and then we can also look at the specific average for each of these areas. So let's kind of go from left to right across the chart and talk about you know, what's normal and what would be abnormal and what are the effects on the fire weather. So the next uh, column next to the areas is gonna be the jurisdictional fire station. That's just the closest Los Angeles County fire station to where these metrics are put input to it. The next column is just the identification of those remote automated weather systems. They're known as WIMS. Also, this is their ID number. So that doesn't have a lot of value to us. But the next four columns is the meat and potatoes of what I wanna to talk to you about tonight. So we look at temperature. Um, what does temperature do for us? How does it affect the fire behavior prediction and actual fire behavior? Um, our seasonable temperature along the coastline this time of year is about 75 degrees. When those temperatures get up to uh, 90 degrees, we know we're in, usually gonna be in a high fire threat potential area. But more importantly, what, what role does the temperature play with the fuel beds and the, the behavior of the fire? And that's what we wanna talk about here. So temperature does a few things. As the temperature goes up, it dries out the moisture in the air, known as the humidity. So as the temperature goes up, the humidity goes down, these are more favorable conditions for fire. Uh, in addition to that, the temperature serves to dry out the fuels. Uh, we always talk about live fuels. We're also gonna talk about dead fuels tonight, but it drives out both of these fuel beds. So that makes them more readily uh, susceptible to fire. The last thing that we don't think about too often is that temperature also serves <clears throat> to raise the temperature of the fuels themselves. So it brings the fuel temperatures closer to the point of ignition. So when fire is introduced into the scheme of things, it's more easily ignited. <clears throat> you can look at these different areas. You look at Chesboro, this was from July 30th. Chesboro had a temperature of 89. Well, that's a significant difference from Leo Carrillo at 72. So I just wanna uh, show you that there's a wide range of numbers when we look at the Santa Monica Mountains. And that's why we get an average for that area. So that kind of covers temperature. Next, we look at the relative humidities. Uh, relative humidity is the moisture content in there. We all have a pretty good idea of that. We know that when we're in fire weather, we feel that. We feel that in our skin, right? Everything gets dry. Uh, normally, day to day, we have uh, humidities that range in the mid 50s along the coast. <clears throat> this is on a scale of one to, one to 100, by the way, for the humidities, one to 100 or so. But we can see again, as we go across the mountains over to Chesboro, that it's a little bit different on that side. It's usually drier. So it's gonna have <clears throat> a lower humidity rating. So what, what does it get down to for on a high fire threat day? Where do we start worrying about humidity component? <clears throat> that number starts at about 25%. When we get to 25% humidity, we say the conditions are coming into alignment for the propagation and rapid spread of fire. What does it look like on a high fire danger day? Well, it gets worse. We get down to uh, humidity levels of three to maybe 15%. There's been a few fires in my career where uh, someone came up to me and it said, does it feel dry, Gabe? And I said, yes. And they said, well, the humidity is at one and a half percent right now. So that is the way, way extreme uh, end of the spectrum. But 25% is our key barometer, fuels and the conditions are ready. What role does humidity have in this whole algorithm? <clears throat> the higher the humidity, the higher the fuel moistures in both the live and dead fuels. Um, live and dead fuels both have humidity. Uh, live fuels, uh, we already talked about range from lows of maybe the mid 50s at extreme critical and up to 200%. And again, 60 being the critical level. When we look at dead fuels, 
uh, they range from two to 30%. So the role that the humidity plays in this is that it can either raise the fuel moisture or lower the fuel moisture if it's lower. So that's the role that uh, humidity plays in this. The next thing is the wind. We know that the wind is our enemy. Um, these, just note that these winds are measured at a 20 foot level. Um, on our normal days right now at the coast, they range five to 25 miles per hour. Uh, any of us who go outside on PCH or along the beach, we know that in the afternoon, starting around 2 p.m., the wind speed goes up. The winds are out of the west. And if we're taking a walk west um, towards the west at Zuma Beach, we're walking into the highest wind speeds of the day, day-to-day -day winds, uh, between 2 p.m. and a little bit after sunset. So again, that range is 5 to 25 miles per hour. Uh, we know that when we get into red flag conditions, that the wind speeds can be much higher, um, you know, in that 20 to 40, 20 to 50 mile per hour steady, if gusts certainly 60 to 70 percent or higher. Uh, going back for a minute to normal days like we're in today, what is what does the wind speed go down to at night? It's usually going to get around that 3 to 10 percent. So that just gives us a reference point. How does the wind speed um, affect things as far as the fire? Wind plays a, the obvious role of pushing the fire front. And, and we know we've seen that dramatically. We've also seen the dramatic impact of high winds and to how they can spread embers. Uh, when I grew up in the fire service, maybe my first 15 years, uh, I always said, well, son, these uh, embers can travel in the air up to a half a mile. And I was like, wow, a half a mile, okay. But we now know that these embers can actually travel two to three miles in extreme conditions. And we've seen that, Woolsey was a, a great example of that, unfortunately. But as firefighters are trying to build containment lines around the fire, um, and then we have these embers going downwind um, two to three miles, this starts what we call spot fires. And then sometimes these spot fires grow together and we can even have a second flaming front and it becomes very problematic for firefighters for control of the fire. So the other things that wind does to the fuels is it serves to dry the fuels out. Um, what fuels will be dried out more than others are the smaller fuels. Whether they're live or dead, we look at the diameter of the fuel themselves. So the, the one hour fuels that we're gonna talk about in just a minute are uh, up to a quarter inch in diameter. The 10 hour fuels is what we use as you see in the next column is up to one inch in diameter. So the wind serves to dry both of these out. It has a more rapid effect on the dead fuels than it does on the live fuels. It's more, uh, will react more quickly, and that's why fire managers like to use the dead fuel moisture that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. The other thing that wind speed does uh, for us for um, being problematic to control fires is that as we see fire running uphill with the wind, we can see the flame. We've all seen it. Um, the top of the flame is actually bending over into the mountainside. We have a lot of steep terrain in the Santa Monica Mountains. So this represents a big problem because as that flame bends over, it's serving to preheat the fuels in front of it. Again, raising their ignition temperature up so there's, there's less energy needed to light the, the fuel on fire. So those are the ways that uh, wind affects us in a very negative way. Uh, the next column is one that we may not be as familiar with, and I've mentioned a few times, and that's the dead fuel moisture. Again, that's the measurement of moisture in dead fuel. Uh, under normal conditions, uh, this is not a one to 100 scale either. It's going to be around 2 to 30%. Again, light fuel, uh, light fuel moisture, we talk about uh, 50 or 60 to a, about 140 for the uh, moisture content on live fuels. On dead fuels, it's going to be 2 to 30%. Where is it that we get in trouble with the dead fuel moistures is when that percentage gets down to 3% or so. 
These are generally, when it hits that level, we're generally going to be in a significant weather event. So you can look at the fuel moistures throughout the Santa Monica Mountains in that column, and they're all fairly similar. They range from about 10 to 14 percent. Uh, just know again that that 10 hour or that uh, 10 hour fuel is fuel that is up to one inch in diameter. That's what we measure. Okay, the last column we want to talk about there is the burn index. So all this data gets put into the system, like I said, along with the fuel loading and the fuel types, and these numbers come out, the burn index. It's important to note that this is not a zero to 100 scale on the burn index. Uh, the burn index can go up to some very high numbers as we'll see in just a minute, but this is the number that, the final number that I'm recommending that we take a look at to assess the immediate fire threat. Uh, this comes out daily, so we can look at the threat day to day, whereas the live fuel moisture is only every two weeks. So we look at the burn index, what number is bad? Well, what number is bad in the Santa Monica Mountains for, for a good round number would be about 190, 192. Uh, why is that? Well, if it's that high, we're generally going to be in a red flag condition and something else is gonna to happen to the fire department at that level in this area. Every day in Malibu and in the canyons and on the 101 corridor, all the fire stations, the county fire stations have the same amount of staffing. It's called the minimum staffing level. It doesn't change at all day to day. But when the burn index gets up to that 192 range or so, Los Angeles County Fire augments its staffing. What does that mean? That means they put additional personnel on duty. They'll put a fourth man on fire engines that have three. They'll staff patrols that aren't normally staffed. They'll staff water tenders that aren't normally staffed. So that's a pretty good barometer of a high fire threat day burn index. Uh, another number to look at is 250. At that level, the state kicks in some additional funding and staffs even more positions. So Los Angeles County has used this burn index for several years uh, for many reasons. They look at it as what is the fire threat for a given day and how do we wanna augment staffing? And also how do we wanna move our resources around? If it's a high fire threat day in the Santa Monica Mountains, but Antelope Valley has a low fire threat day, they'll bring resources from the low fire threat areas towards the Malibu area. And many of you have seen uh, a station with five fire engines parked out in front. We call that a strike team. And that's, uh, that's what LA County uses is that burn index to move in additional resources from the county. When it gets up to that 250 threshold, that's where the state kicks in funding and we'll see out of county resources. We'll see Office of Emergency Service fire trucks staged at key fire stations. We'll see strike teams from out of the area staged around the area. So that's, uh, that's kind of the burn index uh, that I wanted to share with you. And um, the beauty of having this daily fire danger analysis, you know, we're, we're very concerned about the live fuel moisture is that it also has that on this sheet for us, okay? Hope I'm not confusing anyone. I just want to talk about one last metrics uh, set of metrics that's on the bottom of this sheet. At the bottom, we see the numbers, the ad or the adjectives rather: low, moderate, high, very high, and extreme. Okay. The question is, you know, where does this plug into all of this this message that we're talking about? You guys have actually seen this in action and you just don't know it. How many of you have seen the Smokey the Bear sign and it says the fire threat today is, and he has an arrow pointing at one of five categories. Well, this is what we're talking about right here. They're color coded and they have those five adjectives. It's not directly related to the burn index. It's related to a whole set of factors, burn index included, but its main point is how, what is the probability of ignition? So if you look on a moderate day, for instance, if it's a moderate rating and an ignition source is brought in to that area, what is the probability 
of ignition. And that's what those adjectives mean. So if we see uh, a very high or an extreme rating under the SM, that stands for the Santa Monica Mountains, and we can see looking at the bottom there that as of July 30th, it was a low rating. So when we get to a very high or extreme, we're gonna be in a red flag situation. So that is kind of all my information uh, for you. I hope I didn't give too many numbers. Uh, if you ask, what should I walk away with? I would say that adjective at the bottom. If we see that very high or extreme, we have a bad potential day coming. And if we see the burn index average at 192 or greater, those, are, those could be our two barometers. Just as a point of, of historical perspective, the Woolsey fire had a burn index of 400. Okay, so it's not a coincidence that that was the largest, most destructive fire in Los Angeles County's history uh, based off of that. So that's um, all I have for you. I, I hope that it was uh, helpful to you. And if anybody has any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gabe. That was, uh, that was good. Questions? Um, before we do that, we do have one public speaker. Okay, Ryan, you're up. Um, I didn't know it was gonna be limited only to this type of report, but I wanted to say that the uh, potential for causing wildfires, they're usually man-made, as we know, uh, from a lot of Edison-created problems. Uh, but the other was from smoking in January of 2007 in the left turn lane at uh, PCH going on to Malibu Canyon Road. You just look out your window anytime, and there's usually a whole pile of cigarettes there when somebody, you know, dumps their cigarette because they want to make a left turn and they don't want to dump their ashes in the, on their left leg. So before they do their turn signal, they throw it out the window. And there's usually hundreds there. But that fire burned down to Malibu Road and burned down houses, um, something like uh, 3.30 to 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It wasn't even dark yet. Um, it burned through Bluffs Park and down uh, onto both sides of Malibu Road and burned houses on the beach, at least three of them that I recall. And it wasn't a particularly windy day. It was just, that's the way it happened. The, the fire actually burned downhill to the beach. So we don't have to have these rotten uh, index numbers to have catastrophe fires, of course. Um, I very much appreciate the report. I want to indicate two things. There was a fire that was probably 2014. I happened to be driving on the US 101 northish in Calabasas from Las Virginis going north. I saw a 1960s Volkswagen bug uh, to the side of the freeway with its engine burning. And I thought, oh, bummer. Well, anyway, there's no place to get off the freeway there except at Lost Hills. And uh, the thing uh, burned all of that Amundsen Ranch area on that side of the freeway. It came back hours later and I go, oh my God, the whole thing burned up there. So from one vehicle to the side of the road, caught the hillside on fire. And we've got steeper hillsides right all along, you know, 20 miles of PCH. So my concern is for vehicle fire, and more notably, as we have more and more electric vehicles, and as these electric vehicles age, and maybe are not well maintained, or you know, need body work, and it's done wrong or something, that there's, there's places on electric cars where the fire department is supposed to bash in the fender, and they can reach in there with these big bolt cutters and cut the power leads. And they're usually around the pillars of the of the back window or front window. And it's it's a thing about training that we have to have the fire department know how to rescue, turn off these 800 volt cars. And there's 1000 volt cars in the design mix right now uh, so that they because they're virtually impossible to put out once they start to melt down. We had the one Tesla melt in the bottom of Malibu Canyon. That was according to Leland Tang. He was quoted. He said the car melted. Uh, he was with the CHP, as you recall. So the biggest concern is on Malibu Canyon Road. If someone pulls over to the side of the road because their car starts smoking, 
and they're right at the base of the hillside and then the whole everything goes up or if two electric cars get into some type of a head-on collision somewhere now you've got twice as much energy twice as much rescue and a fire you virtually can't put out so Ryan, your time is up Chris, Chris, Gabe, I think there was something you wanted to finish up with there and you didn't, you weren't able to. Yes, if I just have another minute and a half. Um, Parker, could you bring, bring up slide seven, uh, the National Weather Service Fire One slide? Uh, I had mentioned to you that um, I would sh share with you another way we could get at the same information. This is a website. It's phenomenal for information. Uh, if you really want to get into it, the um, Fire weather snooper, you can look at all the remote automated weather stations and get live updates of what the humidity, temperature, wind speed average and gusts are on the fire weather snooper. But I wanted to show you how to get to the daily fire analysis and I forgot to do that. So you go down and we have the highlighted box. We're gonna click that, go ahead, Parker, or go to the next slide. And this was what comes up and we're gonna click on the fire weather danger. Go ahead, Parker, next. And that gets us to that same fire danger analysis, daily danger analysis. So I, I wanted to show that. You could bring these slides down, Parker, thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to wrap up with saying that um, last year's fire season in Los Angeles County and in our neighboring counties and this year's fire season thus far have been a very low amount of activity. Uh, we can hope this continues. We've been very lucky, but this was after a, a significant run of from 2020, or I'm sorry, 2000 to 2020, where we had some extraordinarily large fire season, not just in Los Angeles, but around the state. But Los Angeles was very high during those years too. So we've had a relatively quiet year this year and last year, but you know, I mentioned hope and luck, and those aren't good strategies. And I wanted to leave you with that. Uh, preparedness is, and preparedness means looking at this data that we talked about, getting the word out to the public that we can do these home ignition zone assessments. But that's the key, and that's what I wanted to leave you with. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Gabe. And um, as I learned, hope is not a plan. So yeah. um, questions? Uh, yeah, I, I had one. Say, so, um, Gabe, as we take a look at the actions of the water districts in restricting the amount of water that homeowners can use um, for landscape, in some cases, homes where um, keeping some of the, the hillside green is really a, a good measure for some of the fire resistance. But we're seeing I believe a significant increase in, in how dry, potentially dry some of the fuel is because it's, the stuff's just dying off. Um, do you have any stats on that or any information and how are we working with um, like Las Virginia, Las Virginia water districts, you can only water one day a week. Uh, I know for me, it's killing everything. So I'm just wondering how you interpret or look at the effect of some of these restrictions on um, uh, the fire danger. Well, I don't have any data that you're directly requesting, Brent, but I, but I can say that that's leading to the die out of those fine fuels, right? Those, those one hour fuels that are up to a quarter inch in diameter. But it kind of goes to the whole home hardening concept of, you know, where is the big threat around homes? And the immediate threat is that first five feet, right? And, and that's the areas that we want to get away from vegetation anyway. So, the use of succulents is encouraged when we talk to the public. The use of rock, brick, concrete, and dirt are, are um, suggested. But I don't have any direct data uh, to provide a metric on that, on the, on the uh, water district. All right, thank you, Gabe. Anybody else? Nobody? Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, everybody down there in fire safety, Greg and Bradley. We're gonna go on now to 5B. 
And I'd also like to uh, welcome our new Lieutenant Dustin Carr, our new liaison. Dustin, are you, can you unmute there? Dustin. There we go. Okay. There we go. I'm, fig I'm figuring out this uh, Zoom thing here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much. Chair Frost, we do have one public speaker for this item as well. Uh, okay, let's go. Ryan? Um, I'll wait for the end of the report. I may not have anything to say, if he, depending on what's covered. But thank you this time for asking. Let's see here. So we're looking at the month of uh, June last year. So uh, in so far as uh, uh, I'm a little new to this, so I have, uh, you'll excuse me for a moment. It um, uh, looks like a uh, Part one crimes were down almost a percent for the entire month uh, from uh, this uh, year uh, 2021. So that that's a, that's always a positive. Um, let's see here. Um, and so far as uh, fatal collisions and stuff like that, um, PCH, uh, we had one fatal collision that was a pedestrian. Uh, one DUI collision with property damage as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, insofar as traffic citations, uh, this last month here, we're looking at uh, 3,754 parking violations. Uh, many of those likely due to the beach team, 337 non-hazardous, uh, 132 hazardous violations for a total of 4,231 uh, citations total for the month. And then, uh, so right now, obviously our beach team is currently active. They're working hard, uh, uh, making sure everything's under control, making sure uh, people aren't drinking on the beach and, uh, addressing parking issues. I know as mentioned earlier, the RV parking issues, and things like that, obviously, uh, Last month we uh, had that operation. I was actually on shift that night um, regarding the illegal RV parkings. Uh, there has been some public emails regarding uh, uh, just various areas where RVs are parking. And uh, obviously um, we had the uh, issue there's uh, with the Coastal Commission re regarding uh, where we can put the permanent no parking signs and that all has to be run through them. Uh, however, deputies are actively contacting the uh, people that own those vehicles, trying to, uh, you know, find them resources, get them to, to move on and things like that and doing the best we can. Uh, and so far as that's concerned, uh, let's see here. I think in so far as uh, my report's concerned, uh, I think, uh, probably have a more polished report next month uh, uh, as I uh, get used to uh, doing these <laughs> meetings. However, um, I, I would say things, things are looking good in so far as Malibu is concerned. I know there's other concerns, so I can take any of your questions right now and try to address them individually if, uh, if need be. Um, can we circle back to Ryan? Ryan, do you still want to speak? Uh, yes, I had a couple. Um, I noticed the column says that we're down like 1,700% in parking citations. And uh, I'm wondering if that is um, only the number of parking citations written by um, deputies uh, rather than the volunteers on patrol um, or if and how that, that could be because it looked like, if I recall, there were like 3,500 or something tickets uh, this month and well, the June month and then the prior month of, uh, I guess that's um, May, May, I'm sorry, the prior year, that they seem to be uh, somewhat consistent, yet it was down and it said uh, the change. 
but um, I didn't seem accurate. So I'm wondering if it's year to date change is the numbers in the right column and maybe the commission ought to somewhat take that column with a grain of salt because some of these entries are, are very low digit numbers and can skew percentages and so forth off quite a bit. And then the second was if there was any, um, the oral report that uh, basically is a heads up for what occurred in July or even yesterday is you know a tradition of this group. And um, I'd, we would like to hear from, uh, you know, the sheriff or Josh about what maybe he did encounter up at the Trancus Park, which is a city of Malibu owned property and public park for one. Um, so that was the big one. But the other one was, uh, uh, and it was actually in July, we had the strong arm robbery by six uh, masked and hooded uh, 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 people who um, took what was reported to be a half million dollars of upscale merchandise from the Max Field store in the basically city owned lumber yard shopping center, which is operated by a third party contractor. But um, that event was is serious. And um, I'm wondering about why or what information there is and if any cameras are at the gas station uh, describe the getaway vehicle and if it was detected in any cities that do have cameras like Santa Monica or maybe Calabasas and so forth on that one because that was a high-end robbery uh, and it was a coordinated gang event. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Lieutenant Clark, do you want to comment on that about the park? Uh, the the Trancus Park, are we talking about what he mentioned earlier that occurred on March 29th? Is no, that what he's talking about? talking about what happened, I believe it was today. Or yesterday. Oh, no, that, that, that was actually yesterday. yesterday. Um, Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, insofar as the deceased person is concerned, um, obviously, we, we need to make sure that you know, their family and everything has a uh, uh, next to kin has been notified, but I do not believe any foul play or anything like that was suspected. So if anyone's got any further questions on that, uh, uh, please let me know. All right. Um, you know, I just, I want to point out one thing too. I don't, I, I'm pretty sure your figures do not normally have the VOPs in there. But I, for one, can tell you that for the month of July, they wrote 4,118 tickets, uh, okay. just, just them. And I know, I know your figures are June, so I'm kind of jumping ahead for you. But that, if you add something similar to that to, to, to June, their July numbers to June, that'd be a little less, but you're going to be up there at 7,000 or something like that. So anyway. Right. Um, I did want to comment on, uh, on Mr. Embry's uh, citation so the uh the decrease in citations is not a percentage it's actually a number so and that would be the decrease in year-to-date number uh just uh just in, uh so he knows that it's a actual hard number of citations written it's not a percentage Se uh 1700 would bring us into the negative which is impossible as we know so um it, it is in fact if you take uh i believe 13775 year-to-date minus 12066 uh, you're going to be looking at minus 1709 in, as far as the citations are concerned. I believe it's the second to bot last column on the uh, Malibu Lost Hills uh, collision summary report there. Questions for Lieutenant Carr. I seem to have lost part of my screen there. Josh? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, uh, some of the community has reached out to me and um, I'm happy to kind of discuss just real quickly about what I saw happen. Um, I did find the man uh, deceased at the park, um, but I didn't, I don't know like how much I'm allowed to say if there's like an investigation or anything like that. We're talking about the one uh, uh, two days ago, yesterday, correct? Okay. Um, well, if you, uh, 
I, I think you're you're allowed to say you're a member of the public, just like anybody that anybody else that would have come upon a tragedy like that. So you you're welcome to say whatever you you like to, sir. Yeah, I just I just wanted to clear up that you know um, I did speak with him about four o'clock, and we were just chatting. He seemed like a really nice guy, hanging out with his dog, and then uh, I went over with my daughters and my wife to the playground. And uh, saw that he went and lied down on a blanket underneath the trees. And then uh, about an hour later, I went, took a look and uh, noticed he wasn't breathing. His dog is kind of snuggled up against him and uh, checked his pulse. And I mean, that was kind of that. It seemed like he went peacefully. And I don't want to, I don't want any uh, false rumors going around Malibu. I know it's not every day that, um, you know, someone passes away at our parks, but um, I think that Lost Hills uh, responded really quickly. Fire responded really quickly, and I think everyone did a great job. And um, I'm sure we'll be keeping track of his animal, his, his beautiful German Shepherd. And my condolences go out to the family. Thank you, Josh. Um, I got another number here for you, Lieutenant Carr. The VOPs wrote uh, 2,916 Parkers in June, or citations. I don't know that they were all Parkers, but that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, a lot, a lot of our numbers come from uh, when uh, when deputies uh, clear calls for service. Uh, they use a specific stat code for parking sites and things like that. So when that stat code goes in. Um, they enter a number of sites that they've issued, and that's how we get our numbers. So VOPs generally don't have a log on for the uh, computer, so those citations generally won't be included in a report we'd have. So Fair that enough. would be why. We can always get Mr. Russo to speak up when we need him, so that's a good thing. Um, anybody else? Doug, you've got your hand up. Yeah, uh, just quick things. First off, Lieutenant Carr, welcome to the uh, family here, and uh, we look forward to hearing you from you in the future. A uh, couple of things I, I think we want to pass along. In the transition between um, Lieutenant Waters and, and yourself, I know that there's been several uh, emails from the public about particular uh, concerns they may have. Most of it has to do with traffic and parking. Um, hopefully those are getting to you. If they're not, um, um, I guess we can resend them or ask them to resend. But a couple of instances I do know about on uh, PCH, especially on Friday nights and on Saturday nights from about 11 p.m. to about two o'clock, it's a racetrack in the Carbon uh, Beach area. It's a straightaway and um, the neighbors are telling me that uh, it's quite loud and quite, quite a high speed uh, set of racers through there. It seems to be happening on a regular basis. And we also have some cars parked uh, in the Civic Center, and I'll call it at the um, Chevron Station, the Urgent Care, that have been there for some time and they've got bad tags. So if you could just have uh, your deputies take a look at it, and uh, I'll ask people if we can, if we know who to send the messages to, we'll be glad to do that. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I am getting some emails as far as the uh, Carbon Canyon. I don't... Uh, I don't recall seeing an email on that. Do we? Do you know what times those racers are there? Is it an average time, or do they just come randomly? Well, they're uh, complaining basically from about eleven p.m. to about uh, one or two uh, in the morning. And we have something similar to that in the canyons, but it's probably not worth it uh, to try and stake out a canyon at two o'clock in the morning. But the uh, PCA traffic certainly is, and uh, I, yeah. people are becoming more and more concerned about the donuts that they're spotting in the streets. Um, I even had one person tell me they saw him on uh, Malibu Canyon Road, which if you're doing a donut in the two-lane Malibu Canyon Road, more, more power to your uh, uh, health insurance. So They're, they're all over. And uh, Lieutenant Carr, you might want to ask uh, Corey Godot and Alex, because they were on one of the ops one night, and they had some times dialed in when cars were actually massing up at sunset and then coming up the highway by 10 or 11, and they were coming through the Las Flores area at you know, pretty much race speeds. And I know at Paradise Cove, I can hear them out my window uh, between 11 and two or three in the morning. And it's, it's obvious that they're racing off the light up there. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. 
Um, you know what? I will uh, I will send a message out to the uh, the early morning watch commanders, and uh, maybe we can get someone uh, you know uh, set up around there and uh, kind of stake it out a little bit and see see what they uh, find insofar as that's concerned, or at least deter. You know, a lot of times presence will deter such a thing. So um, I, I'll certainly address that with the uh, the shift watch commanders and uh, get some resources down that way. Yeah. Well, thank you very and much. The, yeah, the bad tags, I'll, uh, I'll send, a, you know, we have those x-ray units. Uh, I'll have them go take a look at those cars and uh, take the uh, appropriate action on them. Yeah. Thank All you. right, great. Um, any more hands out there? Brent? No? Chair Frost? I yes. wanted to make sure that you noticed that uh, Drew Smith and Megan Courier from the fire department were on in case anybody had questions for them. I'd like to hear from Drew. I didn't know, I noticed Megan, I just noticed them on here. Um, Drew and Megan, you wanna unmute and... There's Megan. Drew? Where'd you go? Ah, uh, there, there I you am. are. There, everywhere I go, there I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Um, since we're on public safety agency activity, that would obviously be you. It would. Well, um, and gosh, Megan. a lot. A lot yeah, of course, a lot to talk about. And I really like um, all the positive and actually problem solving and challenges that the city's faced with and the dialogue that's going on and how to make it better. I wanted to compliment um, your fire safety personnel, uh, Chief Heisel, Captain Echeverry, and firefighter paramedic uh, Bradley Yoakum, who's also a forester, by the way. And so I've known them for 30 years. We have a great relationship and we have, even though they're retired, from the organization, they're still part of our fire organization and it's gonna complement the city of Malibu so well. Uh, Captain Etcheberry did a phenomenal job on the overview and just knowing that your Los Angeles County Fire Department are leaders in wildfire management from relative risk, the burning index matrix and how we do this is leading the nation because we have, um, the staffing to do it, we have the dedication to do it, and um, it's recognized at the national level uh, with stuff based upon uh, the high quality folks and level of training and expertise that we have. Uh, just looking at some of the land management practices, I uh, really appreciate um, Josh speaking to the rural character. And let's think about the Woolsey fire or look at a hundred years worth of fire history that we've had. The Woolsey fire wasn't anything unique compared to fires that date back to 1900. Those environmental conditions were ripe to support large fire growth, which is um, of human cause and nature because we know we don't live in a fire regime based upon mother nature. And so you do need that human intervention and element so we can look at our targeted large growth days and uh, do upstaffing. But I'll, I'll tell you now, when the Los Angeles County Fire Department and our cooperators, which has the largest initial attack response in the world from our ground resources and our air resources, when the fires get big and get away from us, it's because mother nature is angry and it's the fire's time to win. Captain Etcheberry talked about spotting the receptiveness of the fuels. Also, there was conversation regarding home hardening and how that looks. Um, how do we, we have a blank canvas post Woolsey. How do we want it to look? We, um, it was talked with Josh on goats, so land mammal use. There's significant amount of applications for wildfire resiliency, but also habitat resiliency within the Santa Monica Mountains. The background that I have as a fire behavior analyst is exactly that. It's in fire ecology, land management practices, fire danger in the fire environment. So how do we look at that um, with a working group 
and get uh, people educated on what we can do for the ultimate goal of life safety. Then we go in environmental conservation, property conservation. So besides looking at working the home out, we need to look at the wildlands towards our homes. And there's a lot of different components to that with best practice to aid in mother nature's natural cycle based upon before we were here, very few large fires that happened in the fall in the Santa Monica mountains, because we don't routinely get mother nature caused fires in the fall in ahead of an east wind event to promote that large fire growth. The signage, um, I can tell you that looking and working with zone haven and working at the zones, things that at this point in time that are not gonna change, which is the Topanga zones of nine, Sunset Mesa, which is 10, starting at the far Southeast portion of the city of Malibu that couples into zone 11 through 14, and each one of your zones are dissected into east and west. We have used those as the framework then to map out the rest of Battalion 5, if you will, or the Santa Monica Mountains. And we use road systems, we use fire history, and develop the zones, and also are working with how to make those three letter designators. So we have the zone numbers that is unique and they can be um, identified easily. So the zone concept is gonna work and it's gonna be for an all risk type of environment. It's not just gonna be wildfire threat. It can be any type of disaster that we need to use a zoning concept. So we're working very closely with the sheriff's department with office of emergency management and your fire department to do it right the first time. So the zones and the notification is evolving. We do have best practice in play now, but just remember anytime that we have an incident that we take lessons learned from that to adapt it to best practice because of change, whether it's technology change, you're doing beacon boxes, which is a technology change. So we're working uh, with the developers of the beacon boxes, trying to meet the needs of the cities that want those beacon boxes um, that aid to um, having knowledge to the area. I can talk to being with Chris Frost. Chris and I do a lot of staff rides together to talk about the city of the Malibu, the surrounding wildlands affecting Malibu, and just constantly dissecting what we can do ahead of an event and different challenges that we've had. So his institutional knowledge, uh, writing with me, educating me, or complementing each other is very, uh, very useful and beneficial to the to the fire department. Um, there was a discussion on ornamental vegetation. So water delivery for domestic use is one element and mother nature and how much rainfall was delivered and affects the wildland um, fuel bed are two different animals. So as you look at the chart that Captain Echeverry showed, where the fuels are now, they relatively plus or minus 10 over 100 years worth of data and you saw 40 years worth of data are relatively the same. So we're not in a oh my gosh type of state with our fuels because of some climactic event. They're about where they should be because if you go to the graph, we were 200% of normal going into this and I'll call it fire season. And as mother nature turns off the sprinkler system, um, the soil moistures dry up that affect those wildland fuels. How does it affect our property? Well, when you have non-native vegetation and you have ornamental vegetation that may need a high watering level uh, to maintain uh, its growth and its foiler moisture, if you will, and if you cut that off, 
it's going to dry up like our lawns are doing. And like, so the best practice is to maintain that ornamental vegetation um, and cutting the dead wood out of it. Because uh, as Captain Etcherberry talked about was the fine fuels that of a quarter inch or less. Those are mother nature's sponge that react on a normal day over the course of drying or the course, course of receiving moisture based upon environmental conditions within an hour. When you put a two to 10% relative humidity day, that's not an average day. So over the course of an hour, it doesn't react the same. It really dries out significantly. So you can make it a 20 minute time lag fuel, not a one hour time lag fuel. No different than those fuels if it rains for 20 minutes and it gets totally saturated with moisture, it doesn't react over the course of time an hour, it reacts for that moment that, that it receives moisture or um, moisture is wicked off of it by whatever the element would be, whether it's just solar radiation or a dry wind element. Um, so ornamental vegetation uh, needs to be maintained around the homes and with the inspections that are going on, it's evolving to where we're going into the ember resistance zone, the five feet of the structure, um, and it's a rollout of what we're doing. So we have that ember resistance zone. Uh, houses do burn down an advancing fire front, but as we know, it's the ember cast that are in the, I don't know if you want to call it hundreds, hundreds of millions of embers that find a place that anything that is susceptible to support combustion and it starts out small that we have structure loss after the fact that's why we have a fire front following component to letting the fire go through and then we go back and we um, approach um, and then we approach those those um, smaller fires if we can um, with that I'm gonna stop for now, see if there's any questions and I'll transition because I know Meg Megan has um, some things that she'd like to go over, but is there any questions for me so I don't lose my esteem on any of this and we'll transition it um, to Megan. Ryan has his hand up, I see. I... Thank you. I didn't see you in the meeting earlier. Um, my question is about exercising the various fire hydrants and blowing them out, uh, getting all the rust out, seeing exercising the valves to open and close, make sure they're, you know, you can get them open quick. Um, that's something I saw routinely as a kid growing up, and I haven't seen it in Malibu. I didn't know if this is something you know, you guys say water districts should go do that on their own or not. Uh, the second, it's kind of a manpower issue. Now, the second question had to do with Edison's desalinization program where they would uh, like take a pumper truck, kind of like your, your fire truck, and they'd shoot the insulators on the power poles all up and down PCH late at night. And I, you know, I stopped once and asked them, what are they doing? And they said, well, we're blowing all the salts off the insulators. Otherwise, they arc in the humidity. Sure. And just a couple of days ago, that was happening on the high humidity day here in Malibu. Um, and the, um, I think it was Monday. And the, you know, the, you could see them zapping uh, big arcs on the power poles on Broad Beach Road, for instance. And, you know, I'm wondering if that is a concern of the, the fire department, if that program has stopped. And of course, since then Edison has changed the local delivery our local power from 4,000 up to 16,000 volts on top of their poles here throughout the city. And so if anything, it's exacerbated that issue. Um, so those were the two things, the fire hydrant maintenance, and if any of them are tested on private properties, for instance, a lot of these private neighborhoods um, as well. Thank you. Okay. Good to, see, good to see you again. Thank you, sir. Yes, I've been here the whole time. So yes, we do test the hydrants, but the water companies throughout Los Angeles County, let's just say for lack of better purposes, are owned by different companies. Some of them do not want us spinning their stems and flushing them out. 
and it's hard to break a fire hydrant. Um, and, and two, um, we do those in areas to where it is one of our uh, components of what we do every year is annuals go and test hydrants. One thing that is we are strict on is making sure that if we have a leaking hydrant or a damaged hydrant or something that looks like it's in uh, needs of repair, we notify the responsible water district company to go and do the maintenance. So that communication happens. As far as Edison, they do the maintenance on their lines just like we do our oil changes on our vehicles is they have a maintenance schedule and they have to do it under certain um, atmospheric conditions to pose um, a small threat in having, they're not gonna do it on a high risk day when the Santa Ana winds are blowing. So they do it in several different methods. And talking about how do they conduct and they do zap, yes they do. So they do get aged, we do have mechanical failure, like with anything that's mechanical, you could have mechanical failure, but just knowing you can have energized power lines on a, not, on a routine type of day and have enough of a smoke column and convective energy and have a density and particulate matter in a smoke column that can uh, conduct electricity to get a strike from the power pole or the wires down to the ground. That is quite common when uh, on a wildland fire. Um, and I know that Chief Heisel, uh, uh, Captain Echeverry and uh, Bradley Yoakum could talk to that because we see it is pretty frequent when that happens. So that's a concern to us for our aircraft, but it's also a, a concern to our ground resources in and around power lines because of the arcing capabilities that have the potential to A, hurt somebody or B, start new fires um, and, and put some significant challenges on your firefighting uh, mission. Hope that answered your question. Do, uh, Megan? I couldn't unmute myself, got it. <laughs> um, Hello, everyone. I've seen some of you already today, so it's nice to see you again. Um, I wanted to expand on a couple things um, that were discussed earlier. Uh, first, Sarah and I talked this morning, and um, she mentioned the uh, NOAA radio, NOAA weather radio distribution events that are going to be coming up. Um, long story short, OEM, LA County OEM, uh, use grant money to purchase a lot of these NOAA weather radios and what they do, um, they're basically the same type of radios that they use in the Midwest and the South for um, hurricanes, tornadoes, other weather emergencies. Uh, and LA County has been working with the National Weather Service to start using them for wildfire alerts in um, Southern California. So uh, we got about 20,000 of these radios and they're split between three divisions. So I personally have about 5,000 radios that I need to distribute um, throughout the Santa Monica Mountains region. Uh, so I will be for the next three weeks trying to do a big push to get these radios into the hands of residents so that um, hopefully moving into deeper into fire season, uh, we'll have another tool in the toolbox for notifications and alerts. Uh, one of the great things is that they work uh, without power or cell reception. So um, that should be helpful in lots of areas of Malibu. And so, so Sarah has the flyer and uh, I'm gonna be at Malibu City Hall on the 18th from nine to noon. Um, and there's going to be various other events. I know Brent and I talked earlier about setting um, up some auxiliary events in Malibu. So um, stay tuned for that. And then the second thing uh, Doug mentioned earlier and then Chief Smith briefly discussed is the Zone Haven project, um, which is another project that we've been working on for a long time. Uh, LA County OEM fire and sheriff contracted with a private company called Zone Haven. Uh, to create evacuation zones throughout all of the very high fire hazard severity zones uh, in LA County. And we're pretty much in the final stages of determining the, the boundaries of the zones. And like Chief Smith said, the naming convention. Um, and then once all the zones are finalized and approved, 
uh, we'll have a large Know Your Zone campaign for the whole Santa Monica Mountains area. Uh, so as you said, Doug, if there are any changes, I think the changes to Malibu are minimal, but if there are any changes, there will be a large campaign to try to let all residents know what zone they're part of and um, what that means for them and how, you know, how that'll be used. And then Zone Haven will help us to coordinate our um, notification systems and just basically all the cities and all of the uh, public safety agencies will be on the same page. Uh, and it will save time during the incident because the zones already exist, so we don't need to create them. Um, and then I think that's all I have. The one thing that Chief Smith mentioned that, I, so Topanga, Sunset Mesa and Malibu zones existed prior to the Zone Haven um, project beginning. So as you said, Topanga will be zones one through nine, zones uh, one through nine, and then Sunset Mesa zone 10. But then for the cities, we, we decided to go with a uh, slightly different naming convention to, to make it cohesive throughout the San Monica Mountains. So it's uh, the zeros are the unincorporated areas, and then the 100 series is Malibu, 200 Westlake Village, 300 Agora, 400 Calabasas, and 500 um, Hidden Hills. So it basically just goes clockwise. Um, and I will we'll obviously get you the map so so you guys can see you know the ver the final draft before we um, completely finalize them. But uh, we're in we're close to the end. So that's my update, and that's all I got. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. I saw Sarah's ears perk right up when you started talking about radios and good. That's that's great. Um, do we have any other questions for Megan or Drew for that matter? Josh? Oh, okay, good. All right, well, Gay or uh, Brent? Nothing? Uh, no, I just, I just want to say how pleased I am the um, issue that Megan's talking about with this radios, anything that can be done to help notification uh, and make people more aware of the situation is fabulous. And it's great. I look forward to working with her on that. Drew, always great to see you. We'll talk some more, but thanks. Thank you, Drew and Megan. And that brings us to the end. And if I have no objection from anyone, I'd like to adjourn the meeting in memory of Vin Scully. We're all good with that. Um, can I vote? <laughs> you absolutely can. I knew you'd like that, Mary. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second? I'll second it. All right, Mary, you want to call for the word? Sure. Chair Frost? Yes. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Anit? Yes. Commissioner Spiegel? Yes. Motion carries. You're adjourned. Thank Vice you, Speaker. everyone. Great.